I'm Gwyneth Paltrow. This is the Goop Podcast. My guest today is the award-winning actress, producer, and director Robin Wright. I've admired Robin's work for as long as I can remember, and I was really thrilled to finally get the chance to speak with her. Robin has just released her feature directorial debut, Land. The film is about a woman who's experienced tremendous loss and retreats to the beautiful but unforgiving wilderness to try to find a new way to live. Watching the film felt like being inside a poem. It's so moving, visually stunning, and completely took my breath away. Okay, I am so excited to talk to you on so many levels. First of all, I don't know if you know this, but basically the reason that I wanted to be an actress was when I saw you in Santa Barbara, the TV show, when I was 12 years old. I watched it every day. You were my complete obsession. You were so breathtaking and so natural. And I was like, who is this? This is like what I want to do when I grow up. I'm serious. (laughs) With your fucking long hair and your amazing face and body and all of your natural behavior, I was like, I I need to try to be this person. (laughs) Okay, that is one of the funniest stories of all time because what a cheesy show. Is it I mean, cheesy? It was, it was I don't one know. Of the cheesiest. Hit. Well, and it was so popular at the time. Of course, it was just the 80s, but I just loved mostly the costumes. Come on. With the big 1980s shoulder, shoulder pads, pads, right? <laughs> Everything was about shoulder pads. But you were such a and revelation. Everything was about, oh my God, that's so funny. I swear. <laughs> I, I swear well, to you. I, uh, I mean, I have been your ardent fan since then. Like since I was 12. Oh. I'm serious. I, I I have like loved you from afar forever. So, sweet. so I was just curious, like how did you, what was your path to to being on that show, which obviously then started the rest of your amazing career, but- How did you get on a, how does one get on a soap opera? That was one of the last auditions that I did before I said, I'm throwing in the towel. I suck. I'm never going to get anything. And I bought a ticket to Hawaii, one way ticket to Hawaii to get on a boat and be like, cut the crudite for the, for the crew. That that was my job position. I'm just going to go do that and make some money. And as I got to Hawaii, I got the call saying you you got the part on Santa Barbara that you auditioned for right before you left. And then it was, you know, you sign a two year contract and that's your life at NBC Studios, 16, 18 hours a day, five days a week. old yep. school. And we would sometimes sleep in our dressing rooms and NBC Studios. There's no windows except for in the front where the production people had their offices. So we were kind of in a dungeon with no (laughs) real air circulation. And then we'd go down into the stage dungeon and shoot the show with three cameras. And I lived in Santa Monica and that was in Burbank. I can't, why go home for five hours? Wow. So we'd sleep on our couch in our dressing rooms a lot of the time. It it was insane training, I have to say. Just just in terms of getting accustomed to the rigor and the discipline of the job and like nothing was hard after that. Pretty much, it was almost like boot camp for acting. And also learning to work with three cameras at once. You had to know when to turn, when to favor camera one, et cetera. And some actors had 15 pages of dialogue a day with monologues and crazy kind of memorization you had to have. I never realized the live three camera. So you're sort of editing as you, or they're editing as they go. So the, and, and, and do you know when they're on camera one versus two versus three? Well, what you could see in your periphery was the red light. So you'd know if, if camera three's red light would go off, you knew to go more to the left to get a profile shot for camera one. And they were in the booth editing the movie, the movie, the, the show as we shot it. It was like, it's like a sports event (laughs) a little bit. Incredible. That's amazing. Did, was it fun? It was actually. You join this incredible team of people and you're around each other more than you're around your family. That Mm -hmm. becomes your family. 
and that was the 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 hoot of it is that we would have barbecues on the weekend at the makeup person's house etc and just bonded right. with with our crew and the other actors right it's also a I know for, for me anyway, it was a fun time before I had kids. I felt like I could really engage in that familial side of like shooting something. As soon as I had kids, I was like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to go home. And I just want to go home. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> have you, have you done a series? No, I've only done, I did a guest starring role on a show called Glee like 10 years ago. Right, right. Which I really loved. I had never, I had done a, t- uh, a mini series when I was 19. And then I had done one TV movie and then I, I did film, film, film. And then I went and did this guest starring role. And I loved doing TV because you were, I, you work all day when, you know, it's like you do a film and you're sitting in your trailer all day waiting to do anything. And in TV, it's like, you're it's so exciting. I mean, you're just kind of like on the go and I couldn't believe like, Oh my, you're going to shoot two pages in, in, in half a day. Like, this is unbelievable. They're like, no, we're shooting two pages in two hours. And then another, you know, I just like the pace of it. And the pace of it is incredible, right? It is. It's almost like being on an, an assembly line <laughs> of, of acting. You're like, get in this costume. We're going to shoot it. And how many scenes you have to shoot per day. It's like crazy. being on, this movie, the difference between just pre-production, let's just talk about that, like prep to have four weeks on this movie to prep and talk to your DP and your producers and look at locations and collaborate with the departments that are making your movie. TV, you get maybe five, six days to prep one episode. You started directing on House of Cards. Right. And we're going to talk about Land in a minute because I... It is so exquisite. It is so beautiful. Oh. I cried 40 times. Thank you. I, I love that you were moved. Loved it so much. It's like a poem and I want to talk to you about it, but I I kind of want to understand before we talk about it, your path to directing because you are so gifted at it. And so when did this start to brew in you? And when did you have the guts to kind of, I mean, I don't know, because I, I, you might be completely different than, than I am. But when I was thinking about changing, pivoting a bit and doing something different in my career, it took me like five years to get up the guts to even sort of say it out loud to myself. Did you always know you wanted to direct? Did you feel any trepidation about it? Like, how did you take that step from it being this internal feeling or desire to being something you said out loud to somebody? It took a long time to make that transition of vocalizing Mm -hmm. it, right? And it was always in the recesses of my mind, like, God, one day, one day I would love to direct. And having worked with a handful of great directors Anthony Minghella being mm-hmm, one of them, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And watching that style and the grace that he had and so intelligent. And he was a poet the way he directed actors, right? And then Fincher, right? Same yes, thing. Yeah. You're just like, there's this other guy. Talk about the other end of the spectrum. But learning from each of them as the years went by, and taking notes, like copious notes, like I love that part from that guy. I love that from that woman. And then just sort of building this little diary of, I'm going to be able to have the confidence one day to do it. And when I got on House of Cards, it was two years in. I felt comfortable. I had support and security. And teachers, I had cinema teachers. Mm-hmm. Our camera operator had sh- been shooting for over 47 years. So I learned the camera and lenses from him. We wow. learned about lighting from our DPs. And if I hadn't had that education from that crew, I don't think I would have had the confidence to mm-hmm. say, I'm ready to direct mm-hmm. the show. And they actually encouraged me to do it. So I wow. said, I think I'm ready, whispering. And they said, we got your back. We're going to be with you every step of the way. We've been doing this a lot longer than you. And they they were there. They were my babysitters and my teachers. As an actor, I couldn't wait to be behind the camera to watch the evolution 
that actors produce in a scene where you can tell them a story without just giving them an adjective, like just be happier or be more depressed. And learning to not want to do that, that we've had done to us as directors. Be more depressed when you walk in the room. Well, what does that mean? That that doesn't help me do anything. (laughs) Give me substance and sustenance and then let me imbue that in a take. And I couldn't wait to do that because it's what I missed a lot of the time being an actor. Had you suggested that maybe in, you know, the first couple of episodes you're of House of Cards, you were in less so that you could sort of get your feet wet or no, were you just still starring in every episode right out of the gate? It, it was still starring in every episode, but they, I think they did try to trim a little bit just so I could get my footing. So you were, you, you, at the inception of this, you were immediately doing two giant roles at the same time. You never, you haven't directed anything that you haven't been in. That's right. So intimidating. I mean, I can't, I've, I can't imagine, I can't imagine directing and I certainly can't imagine directing myself in anything. Like I, I can't imagine having all of those plates spinning at the same time. It's, it's extraordinary. You have to have an incredible team of people around you. And that team is your producers that are on set. I had three female producers there every day in the dit tent watching each take. And we had had so much conversation for a year prior, what each scene should be, how I wanted to execute A, B, and C. They took notes. They knew exactly the movie we were all setting out to make. So when I was in front of the camera, I literally would just say, can everybody just clear out for a sec, get out of the cabin? And I would just be alone. And then whatever you do, I would play the song. I have music. I go to music. And then I'd get in that emotional space. And I had a walkie. And I'd said to the AD, okay, I'm ready. Bring them in. And they would come in the cabin and be very quiet. Camera was already set. Lights were set. And I only wanted a couple of people in there, the necessities. You know, if the camera was moving, the DP, if it was locked off, nobody had to be in there except the boom guy and me. Wow. As much as possible that we could do that in the emotional scenes, I would do. Mm. I don't like, I don't know if you're the same. I'm really uncomfortable performing emotional scenes like that or getting naked or I don't like doing it in front of the crew. I'm embarrassed. I feel awkward. I feel self-conscious. Yes. If I have only two people in the room, I feel like I can be more vulnerable, like you were Mm -hmm. saying, be more available to what the scene needs. And also so beautiful to get to see the full arc of those emotions. You know, I feel like if you're editing your own work, you know what you were trying to do and you 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 left it for us to see. It was so beautiful. I was like, ah, oh, everyone should, everyone should be able to say like, no, leave that in. I I, I was trying to do something like I, I got it right there. And you know what I mean? It was like, and it was a very powerful performance. And it was very, you, it felt, it felt like you felt so freed up to me to do what you were doing. It was really empowering to see like as, as a woman to understand you were able to achieve like that depth of transmitting that, that kind of feeling and while being at the helm of the whole thing. You know, I realized I haven't seen a movie in so long. I've been watching House of Cards and, you know, it's like you, you, you kind of, I don't know. I, I don't, I th- and I also obviously in this whole COVID year, it's not like we're going to movie theaters and it also feels like the movie business has changed so much. And I don't know, I I realized, my God, I miss this. I miss this two hours of letting a story unfold like this in, in this beautiful way where it it's taking its time, but yet you're hanging on every scene you don't get that and it's different to television that- yeah because you know and also you're going to have a continuation of yeah your questions will be answered quicker things like that so yeah in this hour and a half window it's a meditation was, it's a meditation 
And trusting that the audience will be patient, that they don't need fast food service all the time. Have you ever had like, well, it's a, ter- it's, a, it's a terrible question because I mean, we've all, but the, as somebody who I lost my dad when I was 30. And so, so much of watching your performance was so familiar to me. And, and I thought, gosh, I've had to then play the, that a couple of times, but did you draw on anything in your life? Like, have you had grief like that? I hope not, but. I haven't, but you know, it's interesting talking to a couple of renowned therapists before I did this movie, because I wasn't going to play the part until the last minute. Oh, really? Who was going to gonna play it? Well, we, we hadn't really, we'd reached out to a few girls and they were either too busy or scheduling conflict, or they had been working too much. They wanted to be a mom, totally get it. And then we got financed really quick. And we had this sh- very slim window in which to get it cast and get up on that mountain and start prepping. So we didn't have time to take the risk of what if we don't get it cast in 48 hours. Wow. So the producer said, you just do it. But <laughs> I, in that 48 hours, I need to understand that level. Mm. We all had trauma, every single one of us. And I talked to this genius doctor, Dr. James Gordon. Yes. He literally, you know, right? So yes. he, he does it for a living. Yes, he's he helps incredible. people transform out of their pain. Yes. And he said, I want to do something with you. I want to get on Zoom and I'm going to do a session with you and I want you to be Edie. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. I don't quite understand because I think I'm going to fall back into me because I know therapy. I know, right? How you you get sort of engulfed in that bubble. You don't even know that you're in. Yeah. And he led me down the path of who that character was. He asked the questions that he would ask someone that had had that experience. And he had these sage advice tidbits that he would have said to somebody that had that experience. And I started weeping when I, like, I mean, like that guttural where your body is responding to Mm. letting the trauma that you've been holding in. And that was mine, obviously, right? You're infusing yourself through the character always anyway. And it was one of the most liberating experiences I've ever had. And I was able to, to intellectually and cognitively understand how to play that person without claiming to know what everybody's grief is about. Wow. That's amazing. How did you find him? Through my oldest, dearest friend, who is one of the writers of Land, Aaron Dignam. Aaron and I have been friends for about 25 years. And she told me, I'm adopting two girls from Africa. Really? Wow. When? She said, well, I'm going to go pick them up in a week. And it's been 18 months, the process. So this happened pretty much overnight where we met in New York. And when I first met Mena, um, there was no means of connection. And I got to see the transformation when they came here and over the course of maybe two years of being with the group, the Capuistas, and it's a family. She had a project at school, and she was supposed to talk about her past. And they don't really want to talk about their past Mm -hmm. um, because there was a war in their country. So it's natural, right? And she adopted two girls from Sierra Leone when they were little bitty. They're now graduates of Stanford with degrees, by the way. Oh, yeah. So she's an amazing (laughs) human being. And she met him. Because they came from very traumatic environment in Sierra Leone in an orphanage. I've never had a stranger that became a friend, but I've had a number of instances. Like I remember being on the train going from Bari to get to Greece. You know how you take the the boat, the train to the boat to get to Greece and met this beautiful man. And I was very young 
And he decided to, to share with me his life story. And this, this was back in like 1983. And he decided to come out and he wanted to share that story with me that he felt like he was born this way and that society was trying to force him to be heterosexual. And I just remember him opening up my mind to this idea because it had never been discussed. This was not, you know, at the forefront of current affairs like it is now. This is the world. Everybody can be free to be who they are. And it wasn't that way then. And that kind of education, that kind of teaching, you never forget those moments. And I didn't know this guy. And we rode on the, on the train for two hours and then I never saw him again. It was actually 1983. So it was right after I graduated high school, I had saved money cleaning houses to go to Europe. And I didn't want to leave Europe. I was like, I need to have enough money to stay there at least for six months to a year. Um, and that was the beginning of the trip. How old are your kids? My daughter's nearly 17, which I cannot believe. And my son is nearly 15. Oh my goodness. You've got teens. I've got full teens. How old are yours? They're You've got gonna... humans, right? You've got, I've got, I've got adults. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple of humans. Yep. They are 28 and almost 30. My eldest is almost 30. I know it's crazy. <laughs> Where have they been with you all year? What was your COVID year? What did it look like? Yes, we have seen each other frequently when things opened up. We'd say, okay, we feel safe. And my son has actually been working at CORE, which is his dad's organization. And they were giving out tests here in uh, Los Angeles. And then they started to spread domestically into many other states and cities. It's just an incredible, basically, it's free. You could go get tested. Now they're giving out vaccines. So he's oh, working wow. there on a daily basis, getting tested all the time. So I feel more comfortable hanging out with him. Amazing. Do you all live in the same city? We do. Yep. Yeah. And what does your daughter do? She is an actress and my son is an actor. They're doing the thing that they said they would never do. Oh, you know, golly. when they were young and they'd come to set. And I'm like, God, I hate going to set. So boring. <sighs> yep, it is. It's boring if you're not working. It's really boring. And then they would always say to us, I would never be an actor. Well, they both are. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Dylan, my daughter is coming out in a movie that her dad directed and starred in and they play father and daughter. Oh my in goodness. the movie and it's based on a true story and it's just a powerful powerful you know based on a true story really great wow. and she's so good in it when is that coming out i think it's going to premiere at can i could be wrong about that with covid i don't know what's happening but right. you know we yeah. were in sundance and it was virtual and we did it so both of your kids have writer i mean actor director parents i that's that's right did, <laughs> was sean helpful at all on how to do both at the same time? He didn't, I, he didn't with me, but you know, that's the first time he directed himself is in this movie that's coming out. Oh gosh. I didn't realize that. He had never been in his movies. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm going to have to ask him, how was that? It's, it's definitely more work. <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit, but it's actually easier to get in front of the camera. Yeah. Because we've done it longer. Right. We, we meaning the novices like me. I'm a novice director and just in the beginner seat. So you're pretty fucking good. I'll tell oh, you. Thank I've you. seen a lot of movies and man, this is a great, this is an exquisitely beautiful film. Oh, Gwen, it really thank is. Thank you so much. Thank you it's for amazing. watching. We've Absolutely. never, I've met you a few times over Barely. The and I've always five years too starstruck to talk to you. So yeah, I was on a red carpet or something. Well, I know, but still it's like, you, 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 you don't know the indelible impact you had on me as a te young teenager. Do you know what, what, what's next? Are you reading stuff? Do you want to direct more films? Like what, what's next? Would love to direct something else. I am going to direct in a couple of months, the last two episodes of season four of Ozark. Oh, you know, I have not seen that show yet. I'm oh behind. God, you have to watch it. You got to watch it. Great. 
It's amazing. What else? What else do I need to watch? Give me your your quarantine list of must. The two from- that I got hooked on three. That one is is off the charts. Fantastic. It's it's even more corrupt than House of Cards, if you can imagine. And then Succession. Did you do that one? Yes, yes. I still have a couple left in there, but I really, really love that one too. I love really Cousin show. Greg. I'm oh very. Oh my god! Right? How they, great is Cousin Greg? Cousin Greg. He's the so reason great. I watch that show. I mean, it's brilliant, but I'm I'm extra into Cousin Greg. The other one that I just watched that was hysterical was called Flowers, with Olivia Coleman. Oh. And it's a British series. You okay. will die. It is off the charts but she's just incredible she's one of my favorite of all time actors she's unbelievable right okay I have two last really quick questions here that I ask all my actor friends who come on my podcast who is the best on-screen kisser Kevin Costner Ooh! oh that's such a good one I mean, it's hard. It's hard off the cuff to answer that, right? Now I'm going back going, how many men have I kissed on camera? A anyway. lot, Robin. A <laughs> lot. <laughs> okay. And last one. And of course, you do not say who, but have you had a romance with a famous person that nobody knows about in the public eye? Yes. <laughs> 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 for some reason that's my favorite question that I love to think about oh who could it be <laughs> okay great. thank you this was so much fun thank you so much honestly thank my deepest congratulations this is a work of art and I oh, I'm, you are such a love I'm, I'm so moved that really that I cried film. I've not cried that hard in a long time it, oh. And your performance is exquisite and just your command of the camera and the, it's just all amazing. Thank <laughs> you.